There aren't that many plug-in hybrid estates to choose from, however the Peugeot 508 is available as a fastback and an estate, which I absolutely love. Now at the time of filming and in the UK, the 508 SW starts from £45,000. However, if you want some extra grunts, you might want to go for the PSC model, which we actually have on review, and that starts from £55,000 without adding any additional options. So in this review, you can see if it's actually worth its price tag and of course, how it compares to some of its key competitors. Now to kick things off, we have to talk about electrification. And here it's quite intriguing to see that the Estate model has got a lower battery pack claim than the Fastback models. Indeed here, the Allure and the GT sit at 11.8 kilowatt hour, and then this moves down to 11.5 kilowatt hour in the PSE model, which we have on review. And then you have got a 12.4 kilowatt hour battery pack in the Fastback models. So I'm not really sure as to what's gone on there. Now, nonetheless, over here, in terms of the electric range, the manufacturer claims that you'll get between 35 to 45 miles, at least on the WLTP test cycle. However, by looking at my own instrument cluster, I didn't notice anything north of 15 miles, which is actually quite disappointing, not only in comparison to what the manufacturer claims as to what you should be able to attain, but also if you look at some of its competitors, which offer you north of 30 to 35 miles. Now, when it comes to the fuel tank, the capacity has not been shared. However, I have been able to notice that via the instrument cluster and while the vehicle was delivered with a full tank of petrol, I saw it sitting at 300 to 350 miles of range. And therefore means if you combine that with the electric range, it means that you should be able to achieve roughly 365 miles without having to stop to refuel or indeed recharge. Now I should also mention that the switch between electric and petrol power is absolutely seamless. You won't actually able to notice it or indeed hear it. However, if you do glance at the instrument cluster, you'll be able to see that when it's in petrol power, it's in white and the speedometer then will switch to blue when it's in electric power. Now, what does this all mean when it comes to the overall fuel efficiency? Well, from my own mixed driving tests, I noticed 45 to 50 MPG, which is actually pretty good. While it's not exactly the best when it comes to a plug-in hybrid, nor when it comes to a plug-in hybrid estate, it is actually still relatively good in comparison to what else you can find out there on the market. Now it's worth noting over here that if you were to run out of electric juice, this will actually drop down to roughly 40 to 45 MPG. And if you were to go for the e-save function, which effectively means that you are using the engine to replenish its battery pack and therefore self-charge while you're on the move, this figure will drop south of roughly 35 to 30 MPG, which is almost no surprise because the vehicle is becoming a little less efficient and therefore replenishing the battery pack while you're on the move. Now it's worth noting over here that you do also have the ability of enabling regenerative braking. This is B mode that can be turned on via the button that's found on the center console and this allows you to also recoup kinetic energy back into the battery pack when you lift off the accelerator pedal so it's good thinking by the manufacturer and it's nice to see that you've actually got the option of enabling and disabling that function which isn't the same that could be said about some of its competitors now you do have the ability of plugging it in and here you have got a 3.7 kilowatt onboard charger that's present on the allure and the gt trims and therefore via its type two pause mean that you can actually go from zero to 100% in three hours and 25 minutes. This time can however be brought down to one hour and 45 minutes if you were to go for the 400 pound option, which upgrades the onboard charger to 7.4 kilowatt. This is however present as standard on the PSC model. In case you're wondering via regular three pin input, in other words, 2.3 kilowatts, it will take you five and a half hours to attain the same level of charge. Moving on, we get onto performance. And in the Allure and GT trims, you have got a 1.6 litre four cylinder engine, which in itself outputs 181 horsepower or 133 kilowatts. This is then combined with an 80 kilowatt front mounted electric motor, which means in combination, you have got 165 kilowatts of power or 225 horsepower. There is also 360 Newton meters of torque. Now, if you want to go one step further, you want to go for the PSE model, which is on review. Here, the engine ramps up to 200 horsepower or 147 kilowatts. 
This then combines with two electric motors. The front mounted 81 kilowatt electric motor with the rear 83 kilowatt motor, where there means in combination you'll get 164 kilowatts of power from the electric motors alone. And when combined with the engine means that you have got 265 kilowatts of power or a whopping 355 horsepower and 520 newton meters of torque. Now using RaceLogic's performance box touch, I had it tested from 0 to 20 miles an hour in 1.62 seconds, 0 to 30 miles an hour in 2.42 seconds, 0 to 60 miles an hour in just 5.51 seconds, which is pretty ridiculous for a hybrid estate, and then 50 to 70 miles an hour in 2.52 seconds. I also recorded a peak acceleration of 0.6 Gs. As for its top speed, in pure EV mode, it'll go between 84 to 86 miles an hour, while outside of this, for example, in the hybrid mode, it'll get up to 149 to 155 miles an hour. Now to drive all that power, you've got an eight-speed automatic gearbox, which will certainly suffice for the vast majority of consumers who might leave it on its auto or sport mode presets. However, if you do want to adjust it on the fly, you've got the paddle shifters. In my opinion, even in terms of its sport mode presets, I felt that the paddle shifters didn't feel all that responsive. The gear shifts were a little bit sluggish. Specifically over here, if I compare it to the likes of the BMW 330e Touring, it's no real match. Similarly, the 508 doesn't feel as engaging to drive in comparison to its BMW rival. However, make no mistake, it's still plenty of fun to drive if you compare it to some of the alternatives out there on the market, specifically if you go for the PSE model. With that said, there is a caveat, and that is when it comes to the overall driving comfort. See, while driving the PSE model, I felt that its suspension was a little bit hardened, and therefore the overall speed bumps, the potholes, or even the anomalies could be felt and sometimes even heard within the cabin. This is due to the fact that Peugeot have opted for a Persuado MacPherson axle setup at the front with a semi-independent multi-axle setup at the rear. This moves over to a twisted beam axle setup in the non-PSE model. It is even more surprising given that the PSE model also has active suspension, which is also an option in the hybrid GT model, therefore meaning that supposedly if you go in the comfort mode, you should be able to actually adjust the suspension on the move and therefore mean that it's going to be a little bit softer. Alas, from my own experience and also from passengers who are sat within the 508SW, that was not quite the case. It is still actually quite stiff and therefore means that you're not going to be left all that comfortable when you're doing those longer drives. Now on a more positive note, the braking performance is actually pretty impressive. The PSE model has got 380mm disc brakes both at the front and rear with a four piston setup. However, in the non-PSE models, you have got 304 by 28 mm at the front and 206 by 12 mm at the rear. Now elsewhere, it's also worth mentioning that the PSE model adds a four-wheel drive configuration, indeed due to the front and rear electric motors, which combine with the petrol engine. And this means that if you're going to be living in more challenging environments, for example, if you're going to be traversing uneven terrain or muddier terrain, you might want to consider PSE model purely for its four wheel drive configuration. So aside from how it's on the road, what about when it comes to be sat within the cabin? Well, here I've got no real major complaints. I really do like that compact steering wheel, the nice use of materials that have been used by the dashboard, the door frames and the center console, and also the stitching work and the upholstery around the seats. Now, if you also got a nice 10 inch infotainment system, which is very responsive, intuitively laid out, and also supports Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, both over a wired and wireless format, both of which are very much appreciated. It is a shame, however, that Android Auto and Apple CarPlay don't feed through turn-based navigation data to the 12.3 inch fully digitalized instrument cluster. It would have been nice to see that integration and therefore goes that little bit step further in comparison to some of its competitors. Nonetheless, the driver's display is customizable and also gives you all the key information that you'll require. You do not have, however, a head-up display, be it as standard or available as an option, and nor do you have those eye toggle buttons, which I've actually come to absolutely love in some of the other Peugeot vehicles. These are customizable touchscreen buttons that can be found towards the center console and give you shortcuts to certain menus via the infotainment system. Nonetheless, you've got physical buttons instead, and these are very much appreciated, for example, if you do want to access the climate controls or the driver assistance systems. Now, for those who are subscribed to the channel, you'll know that I absolutely love doing in-car audio reviews, and indeed there's one for the Peugeot 508 that you'll be able to find up on your pub banner or by following the links down in the description below. 
In a nutshell, you've got an eight speaker configuration in the Allure and the GT trims. However, if you go for the PSE or add a 900 pound option in the GT trim, you'll find a pretty punchy and lively 10 speaker Focal audio system that outputs 690 watts of power. Now elsewhere, I would also like to mention that the overall in-cabin sound measurements that are recorded while driving the 508 SW were a little bit disappointing. And indeed at higher speeds, you're actually not well insulated from the environment around you. Moving on, we get onto storage. And here it's actually quite disappointing to see that the glove box has not been optimized for right-hand drive vehicles. The center console, at least in my opinion, could have also done with a redesign because your smartphone is placed underneath it. And while this does double up as a smartphone wireless charger, it would have been handy to have it a little bit more forward facing. For example, saves you from actually forgetting your smartphone if you leave the vehicle. The small compartment that's found at the top of it is also quite narrow, meaning it doesn't really serve a purpose. However, it does have a 12 volt socket, which can be handy for powering a dash cam. Further down, you've got two cup holders, and then you've also got a butterfly opening design for the center armrest compartment, which will suffice for taking, let's say, a small to medium size wallet, or of course, a small purse. Here, you'll also find two USB Type-C ports, one of which is used to connect up to the infotainment system, and then you'll find a further two USB Type-A ports at the rear of the center console next to the air vents, which will both provide 15 watts of power to your rear occupants. Aside from all of that, you have got the door bins. The front two will accommodate a 500 milliliter bottle alongside some small to medium sized goods, while the rear two are a little bit more limited. It's good to see that all the door bins are actually lined in fabric, which prevents your keys or loose change from rattling about. At the rear of the cabin, you've also got a pull down armrest compartment, which reveals two cup holders. This perfectly brings me on to its boot capacity. And in the fastback model, you've got 487 litres to play around with, or 1,537 litres if you drop down the seats. This moves up to 530 litres and 1,780 litres respectively in the estate model. And indeed, that gives you far greater capacity. Now, better still, all the models have got that hatchback design, making it very easy to access the boot. You've got a flat loading bay, a small underfloor compartment, which will suffice for taking your tire repair kit and also a set of charging cables. You've then got 60-40 rear split folding seats, which can easily be dropped down via lever that's found in the boot, making it quite convenient. And you've also got an integrated ski latch. Better still, in the PSE model, you've got an electric tailgate but this can also be added as a 400 to 425 pound option in the other trim levels. So what about when it comes to seating comfort? Well, at the front, as standard in the Allure trim, you've got manually adjustable seats. However, in the GT model, you have got part electronic AGR seats with a heated functionality. This, by the way, can be added for an additional 500 pounds in the entry level trim. In the top spec PSE model, you've got eight way electronic controls with a massage function. This can also be added in the GT trim for a whopping £2,050. Now, despite actually having the PSE model with its massage function, I did feel that the front seats were a bit stiff and therefore caused a little bit of lower back pain on those longer drives. Of course, this is quite subjective, but I'd be curious to know your thoughts down in the comment section below. Now, at the rear of the cabin, there is decent amount of headroom and legroom for adults. As someone who's just under six foot, I didn't feel too uncomfortable. However, it is worth mentioning that for an estate vehicle, one might have expected a little bit better. And here I feel that some of its competitors do offer a little bit better headroom and legroom for taller sized adults. Nonetheless, it is good to see that Peugeot has optimized the rear footwell design by providing a small little hump for the transmission tunnel, meaning that your rear middle occupant won't be left that uncomfortable if you're going on those longer drives. Elsewhere, I would also like to point out that a panoramic roof with an electric sunshade is available as a £1,100 option. Now, what I really do love about the 508 is over exterior design. It is very alluring. And yes, pun the pun. At the front, you've got the three-claw design, which is very much similar to other Peugeot vehicles. You then have got these slender headlights, which feed into the front grille. And you've also got the front splitter, which has got that sort of aggressive stance. In fact, in the PSE model, you've also got the floating blades, which give it an even more sportier look to it. Now at the side, you have got 17 inch alloys that come fitted as standard in the Allure. This moves up to 18 inch in the GT model, although 19 inch is also available as an option, while the PSE model, which is on review, gives you even larger 20 inch alloys. Now as for the rear of the vehicle, you've got a nice look, and this is thanks to the fact you've got an integrated spoiler, thin looking tail lights, and a boot which feeds seamlessly with the rear bumper. 
It's in fact quite rare to see rear outward facing exhaust pipes. And yes, they are not actually fake. So therefore it does actually stand out in comparison to some of its modern competitors. Now, in terms of your color options, it comes as standard in Eclipse Blue. However, if you want white or three different shades of gray or indeed black, it'll cost you £750. The Elixir Red will cost you £950 instead. The PSE model is a little bit duller with a gray as standard or a black or the pictured white available as an optional £650. It is also worth noting that roof bars come fitted as standard in the SW model, in other words, the estate, with a maxed brake trailer capacity of 1,260 to 1,300 kilograms. Let's move on and talk about safety. Now, at the time of filming, it hasn't been tested by Euro NCAP. And here the 508 was tested back in 2019, and therefore the rating is no longer valid for the recent model. However, what I can talk about are the driver assistance systems. And here it's great to see that you've got a whole bunch of them that come fitted as standard. You've got cruise control with speed limiter, lane keeping assist, speed limit recognition, extended traffic sign recognition, driver attention alert, emergency brake assist, front collision warning, intelligent speed adaptation and blind spot detection, all of which are very much appreciated. Now in the GT trim, you have also got adaptive cruise control with stop and go technology, which is actually excellent. It keeps you at a safe distance from the leading vehicle and doesn't feel jerky either. However, the lane positioning assistant couldn't be praised as well. It does give you steering support on the motorway, although it could be a little bit improved, especially here if you compare it with some of its competitors. Note it's worth adding that here, if you do want these functionalities on the Allure trim, you can add it as an additional £600 option. Now the PSE model goes a step further by adding night vision. This effectively scans the road in the evening and gives you an alert on the instrument cluster of any sort of objects, for example, animals, or for example, a pedestrian crossing that you might not have noticed. It does actually work a treat. However, is something that might be a little bit redundant for certain individuals. Here it can be added for a whopping 1,300 pounds in the GT trim. Now, I would just like to point out that some of the driving assistance systems can actually be disabled via the infotainment system. For example, the lane keeping assist, which just feels a little bit counterintuitive if you live near country roads. Now here, if you do want to access it, Persia have actually thought about it. You've got a physical button that's found underneath the 10 inch infotainment system. And then through the display itself, you can set shortcuts and therefore means that it's very easy to disable them, even if you've just set off. Now, aside from all this, I would just like to mention that the vehicle has got a 10.8 meter turning circle, which is actually pretty impressive for an estate, therefore making it very easy to maneuver in a tight parking space. Better still, you've got front and rear parking sensors that come fitted as standard and a rear view camera. The GT and the PSE models have got a 360 degree HD camera system, which gives you even more peace of mind, for example, preventing you from curbing your rims. This can be added as a £600 option in the Allure trim. As for the overall visibility, at the rear it's a little bit limited, however you have got that rear wiper which is always appreciated. You've then got large openings towards the side, and then the frontal visibility is decent, however I have found that very much like other Stellantis vehicles, that the rear view mirror is a little bit further down the windscreen than it should be, and therefore does take a little bit of my frontal vision. So with all that in mind, it brings us on to our verdict. And here the Peugeot 508 does actually tick quite a few boxes. It's pretty engaging to drive, albeit it's not exactly class leading. It packs a punch, at least if you go for the PSC model, has got a good use of technology within the cabin and plenty of driver assistance systems that come fitted as standard. It's also very nice to look at both inside and out. And you've also got good amount of boot capacity, specifically if you go for the 508 SW, in other words, the estate format. However, there are certain things that you might want to consider before going out and buying the Peugeot. First off, you've got the overall driving comfort, which isn't exactly the best. The seats are a little bit stiff, at least for my liking, and the rear headroom and legroom could have been further optimized. Especially over here, we're looking at the SW format. One might have considered it actually being a little bit better than some of its competitors. More importantly is the fact that its overall electric range is lackluster and therefore it does affect your overall fuel economy and also the fact that you have got an asking price that starts from £45,000 and goes up to £55,000 for the PSE model makes it a little bit hard to outright recommend considering some of the alternatives out there from the Volkswagen group and also from the BMW group. Now we'd be curious to know what you make of the Peugeot down in the comment section below and if you would pick it over some of its key competitors. 
And if you have enjoyed this detailed independent review, definitely do consider dropping a like, subscribing and hitting that bell notification, all of which would be greatly appreciated. As such, I've been Chris from Totally EV and I hopefully see you next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.